welcome to the Spawn Chunks, episode number 50 Yay. for Monday, July 29th, 2019. My name is Joel Duggan, and joining me as always is Johnny, or as you may know him better, Pixel Riffs on the internet, and he is the Iron Farmer. I am. Welcome, sir. I am the Iron Farmer, and my tractor is made of iron, and all of my equipment is now made of iron, except for the diamond <laughs> stuff that I'm carrying around but yes oh gosh the iron farms we'll get into those a little bit in the uh, in the quick login i'm sure but uh, happy 50 episodes this is quite the milestone and we, we we seem to celebrate milestones all over the place with this show because we've got minecraft numbers at like 32 and 64 and we've got 50 and we've probably got 100 we've got our year of podcasting mm -hmm. coming up and oh boy yeah there's 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 a lot of things to celebrate it feels like but that feels like a good it's a party atmosphere and i'm always happy with that no, I agree. Uh, and for those of you that are wondering, uh, the Sponge Chunks first aired, or first, I guess, published on August 9th, 2018. So our one year episode is going to be August 12th, Monday, August 12th. That's when we're that's where we're putting our foot down and saying, okay, this is this marks the the march forward. Uh, and, as far and as how, the one year. how far away 2018 feels at this point it's really oh, strange gosh, right? I, I, I feel like the last podcast was months ago because of how I, I spent a fair amount of time away from the game this week let's let's <laughs> smoothly yeah. transition this into what we've been doing because i i've been basically away from my pc for about four days which feels like an eternity in internet time you ever feel like <laughs> time, time on the internet goes like super quickly and i will spend a couple of days not publishing an episode uh, because it's the weekend and i don't publish episodes on saturdays and sundays on my youtube channel and i'll get comments saying where have you gone have you stopped uploading this series and i'm like no guys oh i just gosh. do monday to friday so people are just like <laughs> on, on the internet everything just moves so fast and yeah having spent a bit of time helping my parents out helping me with the garden um i yeah you can, you can hear more about that in the render distance we've, we've talked a bunch about what we've been doing outside of the game but i feel like i haven't played for a little while so i sat down yesterday to do a stream and i was just almost getting getting reacquainted with the game it felt like um so we've been punching a tree in real life uh, and and I'm I'm happy to be going back to punching trees in virtual. It's it's so much quicker <laughs> to harvest wood in Minecraft than it is to harvest it in real life. Um, but aside from iron farming, which I've done pretty extensively last week, I have been trying to build more. I've laid down the foundations for a bunch of stuff in the town that's sort of next to my spawn point. And today I published an episode about moving shulkers back from the end. Uh, in with a view to eventually completing the how did we get here advancement and having all of the status effects at once so that's the first step in what's going to be quite a long process of getting all of that stuff together but it is kind of the white whale as far as the advancements go it's the only one i've never done before and at this point it's the only one i haven't done in the survival guide world so try my best at that but moving shulkers is fun it's something i've not done for a while and it was good to revisit that for the survival guide Without encroaching on all the people that are going to rush and watch the video, uh, I'm guessing you put them in a minecart like you would any other any other mob? Kind of, yes. Uh, you start by trapping them in a boat because you can put boats down anywhere and that's kind of a, a slightly easier way of just spontaneously picking up a shulker. And then right. there's, there's this really fun thing you can do, which you might have done before, where if you have a boat riding a minecart like if you roll a, a minecart into a boat because the boat is also an entity it picks up the boat and then they don't lose momentum at all when they're traveling in a certain direction so if you push a minecart down a hill into a boat that minecart will keep going for as long as there's rail regardless of the type of rail uh, so Whoa. what you do is you get a shulker in a boat and then you push a minecart into that boat and then the shulker and the boat travel off into the distance and i built the rail beforehand just to save myself some time it's what i did on my stream the other day and so that goes all the way from the outer end islands where i have a very close end city to the the, the kind of central outer ring um and then that goes about a thousand blocks back to the mainland and the shulker can travel it at speed the entire way without you using powered rails and now i have an iron farm i'm just using regular minecart rail for it and it was it was oh, cool yeah. I did not know that. It actually kind of makes me wonder how a boat in a minecart is not used more often in like nether travel for people that just want to go down a straight tunnel and yeah. not have to worry about that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, th I think it may just be the speed and it's still slightly awkward to do if you're a player. Right, but, it's uh, not 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 as not as um, 
something you want not something you want to repeat you know every time you want to take that tunnel is to put a mine cart in yeah yeah you, and and, yeah, and okay. pe people already have a hard enough time putting down boats to use ice boat roads and and yeah you know, there's, there's always people kind of working out whatever the best way of the most convenient way of doing the transportation stuff is so yeah hmm. it was it was fun though and once you get the shulker back to the end portal like the return portal that takes you back to the overworld that's the difficult part because you've got to limit the area that it can teleport to around the portal release it so that it decides to position itself over the top of the portal frame uh in, in the, the actual portal blocks themselves and then use a piston to push it in and if you use a piston to oh. move it the piston will actually push it and it won't teleport quickly enough in order for it to uh to you know not be able to get sucked away by the end portal and and turn up in the overworld and then they turn up not at world spawn point uh, and not at your spawn point they turn up at zero zero so if you're doing this expecting to get a shulker wherever you are in the world and you're not next to like the, the very center of the world then you've got a lot of traveling to do from that point onwards but yeah that oh, i know how interesting i did that three times uh i did it twice the first time around because i didn't think it worked and then i realized they turn up at like world center and uh so i did i did it a third time for the video just to make sure that i had the the proper method on camera Huh. So, outside of uh, the how did you get here achievement, are, th are there any other really, I guess, benefits to bringing a shulker into the into the overworld? Aside from bragging rights, there is one, and it's a method that's been used extensively on technical servers like Psycraft, and it's having a hostile mob switch in your world basically oh. an, an analog way of playing in peaceful where regardless of the difficulty you have set you basically set up a bunch of shulkers on a platform that you can effectively have them all teleport away from and you put that platform in your spawn chunks and so anytime you want all of the shulkers to teleport to it you push it within range of them you cause them all to teleport they all end up in the spawn chunks and they're constantly loaded and being hostile right. mobs that means that no hostile mobs are going to spawn anywhere else in the world and then whenever you want to have hostile mobs spawn elsewhere again you move that platform and they teleport to somewhere that's outside of the spawn chunks that can safely unload and then you've got hostile mob spawning everywhere else so it's quite a long and complicated process because the hostile mob cap i think is something like 70 and it increases per player so you'd have to move a lot of shulkers from a lot of end cities uh luckily the end city i have is quite large and i don't know if i plan on attempting the mob switch thing at least not for a long time but it's interesting that it can be done in theory which is basically most of what they do on Psycraft. is like isn't it cool that we can do this uh so yeah that's that's the only other real reason to bring the shulker to the overworld but given that i plan on doing the thing i was doing a while back where i'm making a museum that will include uh, an exhibit for mobs basically a zoo where i'm going to try and trap one of every different kind of mob um except maybe the wither still not quite sure how i'm going to manage that but we'll see and uh yeah I, I think having a shulker in that museum would be super fun and have it next to a shulker box and be like natural camouflage in it <laughs> this is the shulker in its natural environment <laughs> nice i i kind of wish you could breed shulkers like if you could it's, it sounds like an awful lot of work to get them back yeah. to the overworld oh, and if it you is. could and if there was something where they would only breed in the overworld like that that wouldn't be kind of like a game breaking you know infinite shulker kind of thing but yeah it would be it would be really cool if you could just get two back and then eventually get them to breed and create other shulkers. Not to mention, can you imagine how cute a baby shulker would sound? <laughs> just like, the, the, the yeah. tiniest little like blah, blah, blah kind of noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That totally, would be totally. that would actually be a fun data pack. Like just forget forget just breeding them even just like you know having uh random shulkers spawn as like small ones and yeah. just, just have them be small change just change the pitch on the audio and make it play slightly different like that could be that could be very entertaining for like yeah. no other purpose other than just a cute factor right and you've got voodoo beards shulker mites pack haven't you running on the i do yeah. i do and and as spoiled as that has made us i still often kind of complain about how long it takes uh yeah it's because there's two wait periods like uh so the way that it works for people that don't that don't know and aren't aware uh if you spawn an ender mite on purper it will eventually uh burrow in like a silverfish and turn the purper into a shulker at which point you can then kill the shulker 
excuse me, the shulker. I always have trouble with that word on the mic. <laughs> um, so the other data pack that we have is from uh, is from the Hermacraft, the vanilla tweaks set, which is every shulker when killed will drop two uh, shulker cell shells. So you don't have to worry about, you know, just getting one and just having all that kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the problem is that you have, first you have the weight of how long randomly it takes you to generate an endromite. So you essentially put yourself in a, we'll say like a 10 by five or, or larger uh, pit, you know, too deep with ladders on a couple sides uh, that's got a floor of purper. And you just start pitching ender pearls back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until you generate an endermite. So that takes up to 10 minutes sometimes. Uh, and then you have to get out and you just wait. And it's got, there's no set time period that I can see. And if there is, it's set really long. So you could be waiting for a very long time for this endermite to, um, to burrow into a shulker. In my experience, it always happens. I've never had an endermite disappear uh, yeah. on me, like despawn. Uh, but it does take a really long time. And then, of course, you've got to kill the shulker. And sometimes that's easier than not if you if you don't if you happen to get hit by the bullets. And of course, then you get, you know, you're up in the air and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I as as e as much as that is far easier than searching forever and potentially not finding, you know, end cities and, and potentially dying because there's so many ways to die in an end city. Uh, it's much safer. But even then, I'm starting to complain about how long it takes. Yeah, I, I think I think that is probably one of the closest data packs to something I would like to be vanilla behavior because yeah. it is, as you say, gated behind how long it takes, and of course, like the health risks, we'll say, involved in throwing lots of ender pearls and taking damage constantly. Plus, the yeah, the the amount of time it takes to spawn an endermite in the first place, and then how mm -hmm. long you're waiting around. The fact that any endermen that are nearby can potentially get aggroed by the endermite and come and kill it before it burrows you know th mm -hmm. there there are factors at play there that i feel like means it wouldn't be too overpowered to have it once you have the ability to farm ender pearls and purple then i feel like that's almost a balanced gameplay mechanic i i expect the folks at moyang might disagree but i think having that kind of renewable shulker mechanic is nicer for multiplayer servers especially especially the people who do stuff on a yes. much larger scale than it is to have to constantly reset the end i feel like any gameplay mechanic that is currently being replaced by an admin action potentially needs addressing at some point in the future and so i kind of hope that maybe they'll revisit that in future if not this particular mechanic for respawning shulkers then at least a way that means we don't have to keep resetting the end dimension because that's just a bit of a pain for admins and there are gameplay led solutions to that i think but we're getting a little bit too much into speculation here I think. yeah 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 but that i mean that's essentially that's essentially um uh, what we have on the server and most most of the data packs that i um that i use are are meant to be like that kind of like vanilla-esque like i yeah. don't really want to go outside of that like i saw i don't really understand it it looked like it was potentially a data pack that mimics like the um is it Tinker's Construct that allows you to have like a, the hammer that takes like the three by three and the six by six? Like there the, are, there the are various by... mods, but Tinker's is probably the most popular. Probably one, yeah. one of them. Yeah. So like I saw something like that where you could apply that to a pickaxe and use like data points and stuff like that to to create that kind of a thing if you wanted it. And that's where I kind of go like, uh, I'm not at that stage yet. Like I yeah. still feel like that's kind of outside because we have a, 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 what's it called? A um, wither skeleton farm. So I think on my person alone, I have four unused beacons. So like there's, <laughs> I don't, I don't need a hammer because I really, all I need to do is just set up the, the beacons and I have insta mine and I can blitz through, yeah. you know, large areas should I, should I need to, uh, as the game designed. And I don't really feel like that's, um, you know, I, I don't need to go into a three by three. Uh, however, like it's one of those things where I can understand it in, in a modded situation because a lot of times modded and for anybody that's a content creator people are doing a modded as a second series so if you want to explore the mod and you don't want to spend yet more time grinding which we'll get to later i can really understand the addition of that kind of thing in your mod pack because it means that you're going to be focusing on the mods not on digging a hole mm -hmm. you know yeah and so I, I i get that but for me on the vanilla server especially because we have other people involved i thought it would be best to just kind of like keep things as vanilla as possible 
yeah so- sounds pretty sensible to me and and i think yeah the uh the the tweaking of crafting recipes and the occasional sort of vanilla plus edition is not going to mm-hmm. hamper people's enjoyment of the vanilla game and its mechanics i feel like mods typically tend to find stuff that's a substitute for vanilla mechanics or, or sort of an augmentation of it more heavily than just like mm-hmm. having renewable vanilla resources in a slightly different way so it makes sense uh, have you yeah. been up to much in minecraft this week considering that we've uh, we've both been spending a little bit of time away from the keyboard yeah no between the summer weather uh and and the the heat keeping me out of streaming and of course all the family and uh other related events because i mean i i forgot that with my sister getting married this past weekend which i filled everybody in on the render distance so if you want to hear about that you can check that out there uh but i uh uh i forgot all about uh up until about the day before like oh right there's a rehearsal dinner and then i have errands to run so all of a sudden the the one day wedding turned into joel's busy for four days <laughs> yeah, yeah uh which is fine i mean i i, I don't mind at all of course because it was a wonderful weekend but uh, all of a sudden like you said it's like it's been four or five days and i like i hadn't even turned on my computer which by the way was really nice i yeah. really enjoyed i was even barely on my phone out of essential family text messages like i wasn't on social media like i just i was kind of just chilling out uh, for the weekend. So I have not spent much time. And one of the things that I, I uh, it did make me think of is that I tend to really steer my gameplay away from, uh, from Minecraft when I can't stream. Like when I can't share content creation, like when I can't share what I'm building, I tend to not play. The only yeah. time I really get in and play is when I'm doing more menial tasks. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and I haven't been in the mood to do the grindy stuff. And and like I said, it's also just been too busy. So I haven't really done anything in the game. And what I have done, it's been mostly just like, uh, well, farming shulkers. Uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head how long that took. I want to say it was like 15 minutes to get four shulker boxes. Yeah. Give or take. It feels a lot longer because there's a lot of standing around doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, or not nothing, but like it's, you know, once you get the shulker, you're kind of like, you know, off into your inventory trying to organize stuff you're waiting to hear the ender might stop chirping and start making the shulker like bleh, 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 you know sort of thing um so i really haven't been doing much but i've been looking for the next project and what i think i want to do is uh because of the expansions on the server and where we're taking things i want more beacons and i want more access to to stuff like that uh, I'm also going to be smelting a lot of glass and I need a, a much better fuel source uh, and kind of a one-stop shop. So I have been reviewing and looking very closely at the Fortress Cross Section Farm that Nembon, uh, Nembom, excuse me, has uh, put out. It's the one that Iskel bit, built on Hermitcraft this year. Yeah. And uh, I have to check it out. It's one of those things where I can see it from a distance and I think it might be good. But I think exploring this nether fortress will be probably what I do on my next stream mm-hmm. because I feel like that's kind of a fun, entertaining thing to do with with a crowd. Uh, but it looks like it's a cross section of another fortress uh, that is in the middle of a giant lava lake, which could be ideal for, yeah. for this kind of thing. Uh, I'm, I have to say that I watched the video about the farm and while I understood a lot of the mechanics and stuff i was a little bit disappointed that there wasn't a little bit more instruction in there um so i feel like i might have to go back and maybe watch some of iskull's videos to kind of like get kind of like a uh a, a hands-on look at yeah at how how it was built a bit more of a step-by-step uh, step kind of layer yeah. by layer thing I wish I had thought about it months ago because I remember tuning into one of his streams when he was doing it and I should have like gone and tried to find the download or something or, or fi- found the stream replay because he, he, I don't think he posts those on YouTube. I think if they're all just strictly, you know, Twitch experiences. Yeah. yeah. But there could be there could be a summary video in, in some of his things. This was a long time ago, so uh, I need to revisit it because I'm also looking to expand. Uh, I have been in the mood to do some technical stuff and I think that's where this is all coming from is that I... I haven't been playing because I'm in the mood to do like a technical farm and I don't have a giant need for one right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but that would be the one for the future. Uh, it just looks like so much fun to use. The fact that you get something crazy like three skulls a minute um, <laughs> yeah. is is a little bit bananas. And um, But I'm also thinking uh, uh, for as far as a challenge, one of the things that I like to do is find a farm like that and then say, okay, there are 
four active players on the Citadel, right? We don't need this entire thing. Maybe we don't need five floors. Maybe we need three. Also, how can I build this and have it look good? Uh, yeah. Similar to the gold farm, which is also in the middle of a lava lake for the exact same purpose because it minimizes the spawning spaces. Uh, I wanted to make that gold farm look good. So my donut gold farm has an additional outside. Essentially, it looks like a cake dome and it's all glass and it's to keep you safe from ghasts and spawns and everything else. So I'm also looking at this this fortress farm that's going to be built, of course, in the, in the nether and thinking like, how can I also make this look good? So when you're approaching it, uh, it, it it's kind of an experience to to behold as you're as you're coming at it from from the outside. And what's really cool is that I may try to explore the server a little bit to see if I can find another one. But if this is the right kind of fortress to use, it is really close to our main nether portal. Like yeah. it's only it's only like as far away as my my swamp base, as close as that is to the main hub. It's only that distance again, like maybe a couple hundred blocks. And so as far as like late game travel goes, it's like next door yeah. for the kind of, you know, content you're going to get from it so and that could be a fun like i don't have to think about what i'm doing next project like it's such a big thing that you can always go back you can always improve it you can always you know slab more or spawn proof more or do things to uh get it going and it's going to involve a lot of mechanics that i have never attempted before in minecraft like uh shulker box loaders and all that kind of stuff so yeah um long story short uh, and even kind of points to our topic later this week uh, it does look like something that I'm going to attempt once I get back into into Minecraft. It's been actually, it's been a nice summer break. I'm feeling not necessarily like the need, but I'm feeling the inspiration to get back in and do stuff. Um, because even though I'm not playing Minecraft, I'm still watching you know YouTube series and things like that. And uh, and I find that I've been kind of like finishing watching a YouTube video and be just like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I I can't right now, but I I kind of want to go play, but I have there's a wedding in like 20 minutes, I gotta go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that sort of stuff. Um, but speaking of uh, all of the future things that are coming to Minecraft, we had some news coming in this week about Minecraft Minecon Live. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of a slow news week, so Minecon Live and there's a little bit of stuff about Minecraft Earth, but no snapshots, no, you know, iterations of 1.14. Uh, the big news really was that the Minecon Live co-hosts have been revealed. There are four YouTube content creators who are going to be co-hosting Minecon along with Lydia Winters this year. Uh, you may be familiar with some of them. Personally, I am not. Um, the the Minecon co-host announcements really reminded me how small my corner of the Minecraft community is or how big the rest of the community is by comparison because these are all uh, four, you know, fairly decently sized content creators in terms of, like, their subscribers and viewership and that kind of thing. They all seem like very solid creators, but unfortunately I haven't heard of any of them, so I can't I can't really kind of, you know, comment on who they are or anything. But uh, they are Maswo, Mariella Tai, uh, Shovel and Dang, that's a long name. Uh, so Masuo is a Japanese guy. He was actually um, presenting his announcement video in Japanese, which is kind of cool. I'm not sure if there's going to be like a, a kind of multi-language broadcast or if he's going to be broadcasting in English or what, what the deal is there. If, uh, I, I, I got the Im impression that he was going to be like live on stage with Lydia as opposed to like a rebroadcast where he was kind of translating it for his viewers or anything. So... I presume that was the case. The rest of them were all uh, presenting in, in English, even though Mariela Tai, I believe, is Mexican. Um, I'm pretty sure she makes content in English. Um, Shovel is American, and Dang That's Long Name is a Scottish lad. So a, a very global look at the community, I think, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. Um, and they each have the, individual announcement videos, which you can find on Minecraft's YouTube channel. Yeah, the only name that I recognize is, is Shovel, but only because I've heard it before. Not yeah. because I've I've happened to catch any of her content. It's just it must have come up in some other story or maybe Reddit or something like that. Uh, perhaps I've seen it on Twitter. Uh, and then Marie Latai, um, I was she there last year? I, I she don't... just she looks and sounds familiar, and I just don't know don't where know she, I'm placing her. Maybe she was in one of the kind of um, the like, skits or something like one of the yeah, games. Or, or, or one of one of the little real videos that they were showing every now and again, perhaps. But I don't think she yeah. was, I don't think she was on stage. Uh, I I could be okay. wrong about that. Yeah, no, I just it's the kind of thing where like we were 
doing so much last year during the live, you know, Minecon that, you know, we're trying to do our stream and we're trying to comment and like, so I wasn't necessarily recalling everybody's name or, or especially the stuff where we were talking over it because it didn't feel like it was aimed at us. Yes. Uh, wasn't a lot of news content it was more entertainment content. Then I really wasn't paying attention. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, um, for, for a reminder, you can go to, uh, you can go to minecraft.net, uh, and, uh, and find out a little bit more about, Minecon live it's going to be about 90 minutes broadcast live on september 28th 2019 you can catch it on the minecraft uh, minecon live website uh or you can tune into various other streaming sites they don't really specify but i'm assuming uh youtube and twitch would be two main ones yes uh, and potentially is it mixer or, uh, yeah, or another Mi Mixer, or a live version mixer is owned by microsoft so i imagine yeah, they will definitely have the, a presence the, there as well yeah, I'm sure it'll be across the board. I'm, I'm sure not not hard to find on the day. I don't think um, the uh, Minecraft news will be involved. Content creators are going to be on stage uh, and possibly not on stage. Like they just say content creators. They don't necessarily say who uh, pre and post show bits and on demand community panels. Uh, this is where I sort of wish. Now we're going to get more info coming along. So, for example, the um, on-demand community panels, the suggestions and, and submissions for those have been closed, uh, and more information on that is coming soon. That's right on the main uh, Minecon Live website. Uh, so uh, that is, I can appreciate like that that kind of stuff. They're going to revealing closer to as they get more of a schedule. What I do hope is that Moyang will be a little bit more descriptive leading up to the event. Uh, we know it's not going to be 90 minutes of news. Yeah. I really hope that they don't sprinkle news throughout, which is more than likely what they're going to do, because this isn't an advertising based event. There's no gain from having your audience tune in for the full 90 minutes. Like you don't need to spread the news out bit by bit by bit by bit to keep everybody watching, because that just means that the people that aren't interested in the, um, the content that's probably going to be aimed at a younger audience are going to have to sit there and wait, you know, for the actual news bits to come out. Yeah. Uh, and after watching the, um, the four announcement videos from the hosts, I can very clearly tell that some of them have been brought on board specifically because they would appeal to a younger audience. So I know that probably a, a good half of this is not going to be aimed at say you or I. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm still on the fence. I'm hoping the more information we get, the better we can decide how we want to look at and potentially cover Minecon live. Well, not potentially, we'll obviously cover it, but we're going to be covering the information coming out of it. Not necessarily the event itself. We don't yeah. know. Yeah. I, and, I, I still plan on maybe doing a restream like we did last year, but personally doing it myself on my Twitch channel, as opposed to roping you into that as well. I, f I feel like it's enough of an event that I'd like to get my community around it but not necessarily mm -hmm. something that i want to be like this is the spawn chunks community thing because we're mostly here for news about survival gameplay changing and new features yes and that kind of stuff rather than you know taking part in the energy of it and all of the stuff that's happening on stage yeah now all that said there's potentially going to be some information about minecraft earth as well and that i would be interested in so like it, it's hard to say where that's going to happen yeah that's... i wish like when you go to something like a convention there's often a schedule for your panels and for what's happening and where so you know yep. what hall you want to be in and when the panels are going to start i'm we got the 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 content of the panels last year ahead of the event i i would like to know the content of the event you know, like the welcome and the, you know, the fun and games, the reveal of, you know, 115 and what is happening in the future and, you know, Minecraft Earth. What is it? When is it coming? You know, news and, and features like it would be nice if we knew kind of like when approximately that's going to happen so that yeah. if you are like yourself going to do a rebroadcast, you know when to say, OK, we know that the Minecraft Earth news is coming up. We should focus on what's being said and and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm curious to see if they can give us a little bit more information information as we get a little bit closer to we are still a solid two months away from from minecon live yeah and uh, the the phrasing on demand panels kind of implies to me that they are going to be separate youtube videos like they were last year so they're not going to be part yes. of the main broadcast at all and yeah hopefully we'll get to see some really interesting stuff i imagine there'll be a bit of variety from what they had last year 
uh, but mm -hmm. there are tons of people who I know have already submitted panels and stuff like that. So looking forward to seeing what's there, what the community can contribute to this kind of event. And yeah, as always, looking forward to any any new stuff that might be coming up. Because you reminded me, actually, talking about Minecraft Earth news coming up in this, that Minecraft Dungeons was announced about halfway through last year's Minecon broadcast. So right. we might potentially, if not hearing news about a new title, then at least get them doubling down on exactly what other kind of features we're going to be getting from something like minecraft earth maybe what their roadmap is for that fingers crossed that we get some some solid info because i've heard some people talk about minecraft earth relating to yeah if there's going to be crafting in the game which doesn't seem like it's an element of the game right now but mm. how much stuff you'll be able to do with that further down the line as they roll out updates would be it'd be kind of cool to know what they have in mind for it and i'm glad you brought up minecraft dungeons because like we've heard nothing since e3 yeah, I mean, it's just been the trailer and, I guess, wait for a closed beta announcement because I'm pretty sure they plan on betaing it before it goes out. I would I would imagine release. so. Most most games do these days. And, I mean, Minecraft Earth is, is in a closed beta right now, so... Yes, yes. Speaking yeah, looking of, speaking forward Speaking of to which, uh, by the way, we had one more article we wanted to hit in the news, which was a Twitter thread that you brought up, actually, uh, related to potential for inappropriate content appearing in Minecraft Earth. So doubling down on the concerns we've had in, in previous... Uh, discussions about this game for people potentially posting something inappropriate, b building something inappropriate publicly uh, in Minecraft Earth. And somebody directly asked one of the community managers, I'm pretty sure it was Helen Angel, um, she, um, they were asking her exactly what the plans were for that kind of stuff. And she linked to one of the, the folks who's actually handling that directly. Uh, he is Rai Jin on Twitter. Uh, we'll have his link in the show notes and stuff as well. Uh, including a link to this thread where he said um you know there are plans in the works they can't reveal the full details of how moderation is going to be handled but you won't necessarily be able to post just anything publicly as far as builds that you're you're making so in private you can build whatever you want because nobody else is going to see it but there is going to be a more rigorous moderation process for builds which are posted publicly and available for everybody to see and uh, yeah, it seems like they've got a good grasp of this situa situation because somebody followed up asking, you know, is it going to be something where we submit like a screenshot of something that we see that's inappropriate? And the guy said, that sounds like a good idea in theory, but in practice, it's going to be a lot to hand moderate all of that stuff. So it's we're going to have slightly different systems in place than it just to be like user reports because that's going to get overwhelming really fast. And mm -hmm. potentially the damage has been done by the inappropriate content already being out there before anybody's had a chance to report it, right? Thousands yeah. of people could potentially have seen something before it ever gets acted on by a moderation team. So yeah. while they can't reveal any details about it yet, it's good to know that their their minds are ticking over and they've got some ideas as for how that's going to take place. Well, and forgive me if I get the acronym wrong, but is it the GDPR in Europe that has a really strict um, regulation on privacy and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, the uh, General Data Protection Regulations, I believe is what it's called. Right, yeah. so that kind of thing where, you know, uh, Moyang obviously being in Europe um, and, and this being beta tested in Europe right now, I think that having that those regulations in place means that they're going to be on it's one of their first and foremost concerns uh worth noting uh something that uh, Ragen said was like for your private builds if you really want to be that guy or that girl you can do that referring to you know potentially inappropriate builds yeah. for public builds that's a whole other can of worms and we're working to make sure the inappropriate content is isn't consumed by the community at large so for parents that are concerned about that kind of stuff even though Mo Yang is putting in um, some sort of measure to deal with public uh, community builds, you still could potentially have something happen in your neighborhood among your, you know, your kids or your six or eight friends in the block. Somebody could still do it. And at which point that's not Mo Yang's problem. I want to make sure that people are aware that yeah. at that point, you're going to have to police that yourself and, and, you know, either unfriend that person or like talk to them about it <laughs> because... Yeah. Uh, what I'm curious about, uh, especially, and to steer this away from less of the like the the, the go to inappropriate stuff that I'm sure springs to everybody's mind, uh, what about things that are in public spaces, in terms of uh, like a public park or stuff like that, where it's not necessarily an inappropriate build, but think about you know graffiti on uh, on a building, right, or 
a political statement, right? Yeah. It's not inappropriate. I mean, provided provided that there's no foul language and stuff like that. But, you know, something uh, without, I won't get in, into any politics, but like say you disagree with a certain policy or you disagree with a certain, um, a certain politician down with that person. It's not an inappropriate sentence. It's freedom of speech. But like, if you can put that on the building where, they, you know, near where they are, like say a par parliamentary building, uh, then that brings up a lot of questions. And I'm curious if there's going to be spaces in the public where you just, you just cannot place a Minecraft build. Like even if it is a nice big flat lawn, maybe you just, maybe Minecraft earth just says, nope, you can't put anything here. It doesn't matter what it is. Even if it's a positive, you just, you can't. It may uh, also, so, it may also be that some people's builds, especially if it's a highly populated area that lots of people would be putting down builds, you might not end up seeing everything. Cause I can imagine going there on the map and seeing like a ton of people's builds could potentially lead to the system overloading because there's just too much data being collected and, and broadcast to your machines. So yeah. I, I feel like maybe that stuff would be sharded into different instances where you could only see like three or four people's builds at a time as opposed to lots and lots of them so i remember yeah. like using a slightly different example here you were talking about what if somebody builds like a nice kind of tower that they're really happy with and then somebody else builds like big old skull castle in front of it and blocks the way i don't know yeah. if that's necessarily how it's going to work in public places i expect they'll probably limit it to like only having a few things pop up even if loads of people have thrown their stuff down there yeah. Now, on a positive note, you could also end up with some very cool things where if Minecon Earth has the control to say, okay, well, this is a community space, we can turn on or off the ability to build and place builds in this space, at which point you could partner with a city and say, recent events, uh, say like last month, uh, this month actually in, in Halifax in Nova Scotia, for pride, like you could get a bunch of people together and make like a community pride build that is going to be displayed for the month of, of the event, you know, or Christmas, you know, like Christmas craft fair, you know, get a bunch of people together in like a competition or like get all the kids in the community involved to build something cool, like a Santa's village that's going to be displayed, you know, in the, the center of your town for the month of December, you know, uh, for for public consumption at which point everybody is aware that on january 1st or 15th or whatever it's going to go away yeah uh, that's, that, that's a super cool idea and that could be really cool yeah especially considering that plot builds are already a thing in the minecraft community and having kind of build competitions and stuff like that out there having effectively a plot server but just out there in the world is kind yeah. of a neat idea and 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 de definitely sounds a little bit more inventive and kind of engaging than just reissuing a pikachu with a different hat which is what Pokemon yeah. Go did. So yes. yeah. In interested to see what is coming up next for Minecraft Earth. Hopefully Minecon will have more information. And we'll have more information for you as the weeks roll on if there are any more announcements that we can cover here. But it's probably time to move on to chunk mail and we have a really great reply to our discussion about end gateways that we wanted to highlight. This is from Sovka who says, Hey Joel and Pix, in episode 49 you were talking about how the end gateways plop you out in weird, seemingly random spots once you teleport back to the central island. I remember that Cubfan135 explained it in one of his old Hermitcraft episodes, so I'm going to share it with you so you don't have to do the digging yourself. The explanation starts around 13 minutes into the video and they popped a video link right there in the email we will share that with you guys in the show notes if you're interested in watching it and they just signed off saying thank you for doing such an awesome podcast Sovka thank you very much Sovka and once again cub fan comes through with the science <laughs> yeah more and more I, I see cub fan coming through with these these kind of videos uh I I really appreciate Sovka doing the research and grabbing the link and tossing us to tossing it to us in a like a prompt you know to the point email that's fantastic yeah and this it's is such from, a big help from hermitcraft season four as well it's when he was messing around with end gateways and building their end hub which now that i look at that video looks surprisingly similar to my end hub <laughs> i suppose there's only <laughs> so many ways you can build a giant circle in the end but also yeah i i feel like i, I i'm subconsciously ripping him off a little bit now even though I, I watched relatively little of that season of Hermitcraft uh, so yeah super cool to see uh, the way Cub's explaining it and I'm sure I'll go back to that video a couple of times when I'm planning out my own end hub 
It certainly has some ideas for me. Uh, and I was thinking about your uh, end hub because you're talking about having some spaceships and some docks and some different stuff. You could, depending on what you make the spaceships out of and where vertically you place them, could potentially control where the player comes back to. Like you yeah. could have them leave underneath the ship but return to it, like in it. That if you control things right, it's it's a little bit tricky. But to to summarize Cub's video, the go gateway starts scanning for a valid teleport block in the northwest corner of an eleven by eleven box centered around the gateway portal, uh, and that goes all the way up to like build height. So really, it just finds the first block at a y value that is within that eleven by eleven box, uh, and and dumps the player there. And that explains an awful lot. Uh, as to why I was confused, as to why I was always teetering on the edge of my platform <laughs> yeah. that I built, the the safe platform that I thought that I built around around the uh, um, the uh, gateway portal. So I now have some thoughts for my own thing about like building a glass platform with one solid block to see if that's you know if that will work, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm I'm curious to see if we can if we can manipulate that. I know that I have recently been manipulating the ability for Endermen to teleport. Uh, using double carpets, so you could potentially also use double carpets um, thematically throughout your your gateway portals to control where the player uh, lands. Uh, I will actually have two links. I'll have a link to the video and a link to the time code, which is 13 minutes and 28 seconds on the show notes. So if you're really curious about it, you can just jump straight there and listen to um, Cub give both a a verbal and a detailed visual explanation explanation as to what's going on yeah super cool it's it's always great to get a visual guide for that stuff because a, a lot of the time when i read information say on the minecraft wiki or something like that i have a hard time visualizing stuff theoretically and i i one of the mistakes i made when i was building my um my kind of perimeter around the end portal to stop a shulker from teleporting away is i read the wiki and it said a 17 by 17 box around the shulker so i immediately drew a line out 17 blocks away not thinking that if the box is centered on where the shulker is then that's only eight blocks in every direction plus the block that the shulker is on and so mm -hmm. yeah i ended up building a much larger perimeter than i needed to and then i went back and revisited that and went hang on a second i've done this completely wrong and used far too many like spawn proofing blocks to get the area around the shulker so yeah it's it's so much easier when you have a visual explanation cub is really great at providing those and i highly recommend looking this up if you're interested in that aspect of uh yeah coming back to the central end island yeah, and really, if you're into uh, this kind of tactical Minecraft, uh, go follow Cub because uh, even uh, even when I'm not necessarily interested in the kind of build that he's he's doing on the Hermitcraft server, I kid you not, every time I watch one of his videos, I learn something about Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And so I would props where props are due. I mean, the, the guy knows his stuff. Uh, speaking of technical stuff, uh, if you like this kind of thing, it's the kind of stuff that pops up in our Discord all week long. Uh, so we have a member-only Discord with the people that support us on Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash the Spawn Chunks. Uh, pledging at any level gives you an invite to the Discord channel. And you can get stuff like this about end portals. Uh, actually, the um, the story about the uh, potential inappropriate builds on Minecraft Earth was picked up in our Minecraft Earth channel on Discord. It was submitted by a Cameron, one of our long-term supporters there. So thanks very much for that, Cameron. And thanks to Savka again for supporting, or not, not supporting, but to uh, submitting uh, the link to, to Cubs video. But if you like all this kind of stuff, you want to take part, you want to get it before it even appears on the show, maybe put in your two cents, then check out patreon.com slash the chunks. At higher tiers, our patrons can even have some feedback into the stuff we discuss on the show. Whenever we have a roundtable episode, I do a thing called the Emote Vote, where I give patrons a, a couple of options for the discussion topic that I'm going to bring to the table, and they vote on one, and usually whichever one gets uh, the most votes tends to be the thing that I bring to the discussion. So it's also really cool to get a bit of feedback about the show. This week's discussion topic, however, is one that we brought over from last week because we spent so much time talking about the Minecraft Earth beta footage that people were sharing that we never even got to our main topic for discussion, but I thought this is one that's kind of worth bringing back in. So I want to talk about the grind and why we do this to ourselves uh, because <laughs> as 
as someone who's recently spent a couple of time, uh, a couple of streams breaking bedrock one block at a time. So it takes roughly 30 minutes per block with the method I'm using. And I have, I, I'm, I'm removing bedrock from all of the tops of the end gateways around the central island. So on Java edition, there are 20 of those gateways that can generate. If you do the maths, there are six blocks on each one. That is 120 blocks of bedrock I've got to break. I've done 60 of them so far. It's probably taken me about six hours to do that many. And I've had a lot of people ask me why I'm doing it. And the answer is I don't really know. So I thought it was kind of a fun topic to explore a little bit here. Why we spend this much time grinding in this game. Because there are so many other games we could be playing. And yet Minecraft seems to have that kind of gameplay loop. That kind of like feeling of reward and satisfaction from it. And also a large enough community that there is going to be somebody out there who can appreciate your efforts. But personally... How I feel about the grind is I want to do some stuff that I haven't really seen before. People break bedrock on the nether roof so that they can get up there and build, you know, a donut gold farm and all of the kind of stuff, the, the spawn uh, free environment that you get up there and you can really do some interesting stuff in survival. Um, but most people don't tend to bother breaking bedrock anywhere else, really. Maybe the occasional block on the overworld floor if you've got to build a slime farm really low in the world or something and it's getting in the way. But personally yeah I, I i like the challenge um of of doing kind of stuff that hasn't really been done before or people don't see all that often and just being able to walk into the end gateways is a really fun way of using those compared to you know using a trapdoor to get in or swimming in or throwing an ender pearl as is kind of intended with them um so it's a challenge to myself also a bit of a flex i'm not gonna lie i love the fact that you know i've spent 10 hours getting rid of all of this bedrock and now it's gone and these supposedly unbreakable blocks are broken i also think you know this is a sandbox game i should be able to reshape the world however i want and there are occasional restrictions that with the right application of glitches in this case they are no longer restrictions for you so I'd like to unpack why we spend so much time taking part in such grindy behavior and not just breaking bedrock obviously there's so much stuff in this game that requires vast amounts of time input and with our time being an increasingly valuable commodity I think in the internet age why do you spend so much time in Minecraft? Joel Duggan <laughs> over to mm -hmm. you why, mm -hmm. why do you spend so much time grinding on the projects that you like to do? I think a good portion of it is, for me, the unending completionist aspect of the game. Really good example would be you're digging a room or a hole or a, or a tunnel and you've, you know, it's a three by three and you've dug a little bit too far and you've taken off two of the blocks in the corner of the next three by three space. Chances are you either put those two blocks back or you continue to remove the next seven. <laughs> right yeah uh and so i find uh there's something very sort of cathartic something very rhythmic about just getting down and clearing out a whole sort of thing a uh, really good example is the beacon mine that i have underneath my witch farm i put a beacon down there to help me clear off the swamp to create you know a 128 radius circle of a spawn free environment for uh the witch farm to be a little bit more efficient and I thought, well, I can just put the beacon at the bottom of the world and then I can also just use it to mine out, you know, all of this stuff rather than having to do any kind of um, stri um, not strip mining. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, there's strip mining is what I did. What's the one where you do the, the tunnels? Branch mining. Branch mining. Thank you. Sorry, blanked on that. So instead of doing the branch mining and have to count blocks and figure out where I am, I just like, doesn't matter. Just blitz everything. If it's, if it's not moving, then just wipe it out. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in the process of doing that, the idea was I can just come down here whenever I need more stone and mine it out. So that's not what happened. That was my gameplay until it was done, until yeah. the perimeter of the beacon was empty from like really a 12 block ceiling to to like level from level 11 to level 19. Because uh, really at the time I was short on lapis, so I wanted to have all of the potential lapis I could. And I would just... Every morning I would play Minecraft for 20 minutes before I started my work day and just like mine out a section. I had a bulk storage like I did. It, it, it ended up creating a bunch of other really cool projects like having a water transport, having a sorting system, having a bulk system, like all this kind of cool stuff. And I'm really glad that I did it, but I had no reason 
nor did I have any need to finish the mine. Like, it, really, that mine should be to this day half done mm -hmm. because I've not needed any of the blocks that I've mined out to the to the extent that I did. So I think part of the grind for me is is when you have the, I guess, the mental mood. Like, when you're in the mood to just work on something but you don't want to have to think too hard about it yeah there's a lot of things in this game that really lend itself to just like kick back relax and and do a repetitive task and at the end of it you either have you know a large area slabbed you've got all of your city roads down you've got a huge hole you've got you know whatever it is that you're doing uh you are potentially reaping the benefits of it either via satisfaction or you know by getting drops or doing something with a giant farm and there's always kind of like an end goal. Like there's never, well, I shouldn't say never. There are, usually when people do this, there's usually a reason for the madness, right? Mm -hmm. There's yeah. there's not a, I'm just digging a hole for the sake of digging a hole. Although <laughs> I could probably throw throw a shout out to somebody. Uh, I think Skull Daisy in my personal discord is uh, <laughs> is one of those people that just likes digging a hole. Yeah. Uh, and there are those people out there. Uh, but uh, for me, it's more about like, what's the end end goal of that? And and that's what pushes me forward. Yeah, I, I think for you and I, it's definitely about resources for building because we are mm -hmm. both builders. We, we're kind of keen yes. on having that stuff available to us. And yeah, while for some people, it does seem to be just because I can and to hoard stuff, like the people who just go strip mining for diamonds all day, but then don't have anything to spend them on because they're on a single player world or, you know, they don't want to participate in a server economy. They just like to acquire riches and like sit on them like a dragon, I guess. Then fair, fair play to you if that's if that's your, your jam. But for, for you and I, I think it's more a case of when I want to build something, I need to have those resources available to me so the building process can be quicker. I don't have to stop halfway through a build that I'm getting really into right. so that I can go and get more stone. People ask me when I'm... I do resource gathering streams basically every Tuesday. I go and chop some wood. And people ask me, why do you need this amount of wood? And for a start, I go, well, wood is a resource that you need at all stages of the game. And it's also not something that it's easy to acquire automatically all that fast, especially if you're getting, like, um, say two block uh, wide spruce trees will get you a ton of wood and it's quite i mean it, it's probably fairly easy to demolish them using tnt but setting up an automatic farm for that is also kind of a task in itself so i like to just take these things down manually instead of setting it up to to be automatic but you always need wood for stuff you need it for building you need it to make tools you need it to make all manner of things whether it's interior decorations for builds whether it's planks and stairs and stuff that you plan on using for walls you know, all kinds of things needed there and for some people the solution to the grind is automation but that in itself can get kind of grindy, especially when you start to introduce mods and stuff like that. Like we were talking earlier about having mods, you know, altering the game a little bit and, and moving the gameplay away from vanilla and meaning that you don't have to grind as much for resources when you have stuff being produced in an automated fashion. But then in order to make the things that will produce resources for you, like cobblestone generators or whatever, often enough you have to gather a bunch of resources in order to craft that so the grind becomes all about crafting then rather than about acquiring the resources storing them and then building with them so there's a, a level of grind to basically every aspect of minecraft i have yet to find anything really that doesn't just change the grind to being something slightly different you're always going to have to put in a lot of effort to get the reward but i feel like it's the reward that we're all looking for the state of satisfaction when you complete that large strip mine or that enormous build or that super efficient farm and then what you do with that is collect more resources typically especially with the farms it, it's an interesting cycle to me it's a sort of never-ending process and it's the kind of um it's different from games like let's take stardew valley as an example uh that game tends to it doesn't necessarily feel like a grind but it tends to encourage repeated gameplay by having the first things you do when you wake up in the morning be you know your your money rolls into the amount of you know cash that you've got on screen you check the weather to see when your crops are going to grow you check the television to make sure that there's like if is there good luck today or not and then you go outside and you start harvesting stuff immediately and then you realize you're playing the next day before you know it. And the game saves every time you go to sleep. So you have to play a full day in order for the game to automatically save. 
so it kind of keeps you in the gameplay loop. Minecraft isn't really like that. You, you go mm. to sleep, you wake up, it's the next day, fine, but all you've really done there is just skip the night to make sure monsters don't spawn. It doesn't quite have the same, like, the game autosaves. You can log out at any point. I think it, it's, it's just interesting that some of the stuff that keeps us in the game is this repetitive action a lot of the time. Well, and I think that to me, again, it points back to the completionist thing. Like, I mean, I, you know, I had a big project that should have taken me a while. It's like, yeah, I don't have to think about anything else. I could do this whenever, you know, and it's this 128 radius circle where I have to clear off all of the islands in the swamp so that it's just water on the surface. And I just kept finding myself going and going back to it and not playing or playing for longer than I had planned because the idea of this circle being like two fifths done was annoying me mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's just yeah. you know it's it's you know it, it's tweaking something in me where it's like i really want this to be finished even though i'm looking at it like this is a lot of work like why am i doing this i i do have that battle because unlike you uh minecraft and, and the videos that i create is a very small portion of my creative day so i have to be i have to justify the time in the game in terms of like you know when i look at it from that kind of like headspace yeah and i i do find sometimes i ask myself why am I spending this many hours in this game? Like, <laughs> yeah, what yeah. exactly am I getting out of this? And it's the kind of thing where, like, if I... I mean, take a look at it having two skill sets. Like, you know, hey, I do podcasting and, and creative content with Minecraft. And I also draw. And I create artwork. If I take the 15 hours that it takes me to grind out something in Minecraft and applied that to 15 hours of drawing something, not only would I complete more than one thing, uh, but I would also get a lot better at drawing, you know, <laughs> it, over time. Like if I did that over and over and over again over the course of the year. And so there's this really strange thing where like there's a ceiling in Minecraft in terms of your skill. Like once you get to a certain point in the game and you understand kind of like how it works, you're not necessarily going to get, I'll say, better at the game. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to get better at breaking blocks. You can only do that so fast, right? You can get more efficient at some parts of the game, but you're not necessarily going to be quote unquote better or faster uh, because there's a, there's a, a limit to that. So uh, I always find it interesting when I, I'll have these moments of, I, I look at them as uh, imposter syndrome, you know, like where I'm doing this thing and I'm streaming and I'm doing this stuff and I love my community, but it's like, well, why, wait a minute. <laughs> Like, why, why am I spending this much time in a video game again? Like, yeah. you know, and it's the kind of thing that comes up when it's the summertime and, you know, I, you know, you think about spending outside and I mean, my generation, you can hear your parents in the back of your head, like go play outside, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I find it, I find it can be a challenge. Now, something I've noticed for people like yourself that are full-time content creators is the adoption of having the build content and tutorial-esque content be included in YouTube videos, but the grindy content, the repetitive task content be then repurposed to stream content. Yep. Uh, I notice it with you. I notice it with people like Iskal85 and a number of other hermits where what you see is a 30 second cut in a YouTube video. And in between uh, the creator saying, we did this on Tuesday on a four hour stream, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, placing 20,000 buttons or whether it's building giant circles for nether hubs and end hubs and all that kind of stuff. Then those are the kind of things that end up happening in streams, but still serve a purpose for, for your community. Do you find yourself like planning the grinds now as opposed to just like being controlled by them? Definitely in terms of resource collection, I do, yeah. I, I, I note that I'm out of wood, but I'm like, I'm not going to do that yet. I'm going to wait until we have a stream so that I can chop nice. wood or like that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And that that is, it's good because it's the kind of stuff that I would prefer to do with company around anyway, or at least like some other form of entertainment on in the background. If I was just doing that by myself, I'd have Netflix on the other screen or I would have a podcast playing on right. whatever device I had to hand, you know? So having it take place on a stream both generates content for me and allows me to have some other kind of distraction from, oh great, I've got to chop all of these blocks again. And yeah, I, I feel like that that does kind of allow me to take the rest of the content at a more even pace and not have the interruptions over and over again for, yeah, running out of resources in the middle of a build. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny that... Um that you mentioned that because like I mean, we're, we already have the captive audience but for anybody that's listening that is having that you know complaint on their server or or, or in their minecraft circles but like oh the grind is so long 
we can recommend a podcast that you can tell your friends <laughs> to listen to while they're grinding out Absolutely. <laughs> you know, their beacon mine and stuff like that. Actually, we've had a number of uh, YouTube comments over the last couple of weeks that have pointed out just that. Uh, people are saying like, well, this is great to listen to while I'm doing this rep repetitive, boring task in Minecraft because maybe they aren't content creators. Like maybe they're not, you know, hanging out with friends in Discord while they're uh, while they're mining. Um, incidentally, that's something else that happens in our Discord chat. There is a couple of community audio channels and sometimes people are just playing and doing some something menial and they just want to hang out and chat, you know, talk about the game, talk about the podcast. Yeah. Um, so so that's, that's a really cool thing too. Uh, so one sidebar topic that kind of relates to this I wanted to ask you about. I never really understand people that say I'm bored, I have nothing to do in Minecraft. Uh, I know that is kind of a black and white statement, uh, but I think it's better translated to, I can't decide what I want to do in oh, Minecraft. Yeah, yeah because, absolutely. Because Minecraft is that sandbox game that does not really have any instructions. Yeah. And it's the kind of game where if you can figure out the right project, especially if you're early in the game, then that can all of a sudden snowball into, well, you mentioned, say, you know, a, a, a tree farm. Well, if you're not going to use a TNT duper, then you're going to need TNT. Well, you're going to have to make a creeper farm. Well, now all of a sudden you need a tree farm and a creeper farm, right? Yeah. And that snowballs into creeper farm. Well, I need cats for that. Now I got to breed cats. Like there's there's this, this snowball effect of all these different projects that you have to do to achieve this one goal. Um, and for me, it was, you know, when I first started playing, it was the Snake Mountain thing. And I, I quickly realized when I was building this very large build, uh, as of one of the first things in the game that I needed infrastructure. I needed a storage room. I needed some place to gather stone. I needed some places to keep it. Like it just, it was all this kind of stuff. Uh, but what I think is, is a potential solution. It's obviously going to depend on your personality, but I think one of the potential solutions to, to this would be to have a small variety of things on the go at one time. And this is just something that happened by accident on the Citadel, uh, as I've noticed, where I don't necessarily plow through anymore on the grind and get it all done and then check it off and then move on. What I do now is I'll have one grindy project. Right now it is slabbing the nether around the gold farm. I usually have one technical project. Uh, I think right now they're all closed off. That's probably why I have this itch to do that, that uh, wither skeleton farm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, because previously it was a bunch of stuff happening in the swamp. It was a, a lot of like item collection and waterways and like uh, skeleton spawner stuff. Uh, and so I had that kind of technical itch to scratch. And then I had my my creative one, the, 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 the fortified bridge that I was building in the South Meadows. So I had creative, I had technical, and I had the grindy projects. And I would just do whatever I was in the mood to do when I logged in. So I never felt bored. Like if I was like, oh God, I'm really stuck on this bridge. I don't know what to do. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go hang out with a chat room on Twitch and we're going to, we're going to go do the slabbing of the nether. Or uh, previous to that, it was um, planting a ginormous um, sugarcane field, which is, it's not necessarily grindy, but it's very repetitive yeah. in terms of like, it's, it doesn't feel like, um, it doesn't feel like it's all for naught. Like I find mining is like you, you, at the end, you get a lot of resources and you have a big hole, neither one of which you can really look at immediately and be like, I'm proud of this. Yes. Whereas when you, when you're planting a lot of crops to create that, like that giant wheat farm or that giant kind of like aesthetic thing that you're going to walk by all the time, you reap the rewards of that every single time you walk by it or fly over it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I found that that was one that I would go to as well. And as a, as a new streamer, and I know that we have some people in our community that are talking about starting to stream and we get questions about that a lot. Uh, having that grindy thing is a great way to be able to keep up on the chat room. Uh, Cause I find that when I was doing a very technical build in my, um, in my, uh, my Enderman farm, uh, especially where it was uh, over the void, I was not as chatty. Uh, I was not as um, on top of the chat room as I could have been because I was concentrating on not dying. Yeah. Uh, and and so having something where you're like, ah, I'm safe. I'm just planting wheat. Don't have to worry about much outside of when it gets dark. Then, um, you know, it's a much easier way to kind of like um, get yourself in there. Do you, I haven't really thought about this much. Do you have that spread on the survival guide world? It's it typically I, when I, enter a project it's like i 
am planning on doing this from start to finish for a video so like especially right. as far as technical projects goes i try not to bite off more than i can chew if i know it's going to be a long project i'll maybe split it up over two or three episodes the witch farm for example was three episodes mm -hmm. right because that was going to be large and i still haven't you know spawn proof the entire perimeter of it but i don't really need to i just kind of show an example of what you can do to do that stuff and then yeah as far as grindy projects like my nether hub and the end hub go I will introduce them, I'll say what I want to do, and then I'll do them sort of over the course of various streams and, and off-camera time. I'll come back when I have some stuff to make a tutorial about, and that's kind of what splits the grind up for me, is setting up these occasional episodes where I'm planning to make a tutorial about a specific topic, and that's what carries the content along, and the grind is all sort of in service of that stuff. Now, the... Um, the thing with like stuff like the nether hub is that people will ask me to come back to it but i don't really have anything left to teach about this is how i spawn proof a nether hub this is how i build these are some ghast proof materials i plan to use this is how i avoid ghasts shooting me altogether and then i'm done and so like yeah i i, I don't tend to put in that much off camera grind time for stuff that isn't really going to get any airtime on my channel and until i have nothing left to do on my streams <laughs> in which case that's the, yeah that's when uh, those projects start to creep to the surface again but i find a way to split up the grindy tasks and stop things from getting boring in the kind of either i have nothing to do or i can't decide what to do is occasionally to challenge yourself you know sometimes you just want to log in you want to play some some straightforward minecraft you want to go and fight some creepers you want to explore an abandoned mine shaft some of the stuff that feels like low effort and also high adventure and that's something that Minecraft doesn't have a huge amount of, which I think is why it gets to the grindy stage of things. Because once you've seen one abandoned mineshaft, one woodland mansion, you've basically seen them all. There are permutations, but you don't get to see anything particularly new each time. So the new stuff for me comes from trying technical projects I've never tried before. Things like the automated farms now are relatively new to me i'd never built an iron farm before the survival guide series because i'd always had other people on the servers i was playing on to do it for me right and that's what splits up the grind for me of i have to gather all of these resources is finding stuff that i've never done either inspired by other folks on youtube or just the community in general has this concept called iron farms how can i explore that for myself what are the most straightforward methods of getting that stuff and then eventually you have automated farms for a whole bunch of stuff and as the stock of automated farms increases with stuff like you know tnt harvested cobblestone and wood farms eventually you get to the point where end game for some people in minecraft is reaching a state where you can almost not play the game at all you just kind of afk and stand still and all of the game's resources are collected around you and and that that in itself is weird because then for what are you using these resources i think a lot of the time it especially with really intense automated farms like the kind of stuff il mango produces it's a because we can kind of thing like it comes down to bragging rights and we have pushed the game further than it's ever been pushed before and i don't think that's a bad thing i don't think that's a bad excuse to put a bunch of time into the game and put a lot of effort into the game for the reward of being able to say you did something more than everybody else but it also doesn't have to be the only reason you play I think a lot of people get too bogged down in, well, I have to be doing things in the most efficient way. No, you don't. You just have to do things in a way that satisfies you at the end of the day. And I I think this game, even with this amount of grind in it, still feels very satisfying, ultimately, is my conclusion from it, is having a sense of satisfaction, either that something has been completed or that you've got the resources you need to complete something in future and always looking forward to stuff like that. I would agree. I think the level of control that you get, even with the restrictions of things like bedrock and build limit and, and whatnot, I feel like that's the main, I think, appeal and why uh, a lot of young people in particular get pulled into Minecraft. Because in a world where you are told when to eat, when to sleep, when to go to school, when your homework is due, uh, when you can play a game where you can look at a tree and go like, I don't like it there. I'm going to move it six blocks to the left and just do it. Uh, and with nobody standing in the way and telling you what to do, I can see 
the mass appeal to that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I, especially as a creative person, like when you're an artist or a photographer or somebody that wants to have more control over that kind of thing, being able to just log in and be just like, if you really don't like that desert, you can just get rid of it. <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's up to you, but it's possible. Uh, and I think that that, that alone, I think is one of those things that really is part of that satisfaction. Like it's not just about, um, collection and and building stuff it's about just the control over every little thing because there's other city building games and stuff like that that i've played that is they're frustrated because you can't you can't change where the river goes like you're kind of stuck with with where the resources are uh and and how you have to adapt whereas in minecraft it's like you could choose to adapt and build your your you know your town around the mountain or you could flatten the mountain it's completely up to you it's just mm -hmm. a matter of what kind of time you want to commit to right and thinking about Minecraft Earth, looping that back around to the discussion about Minecraft Earth, the grind is about to take us all outside of our houses. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's, so that's going to be an interesting change of environment for the grind. It's still going to be roughly the same, you know, collecting resources and stuff like that, but it's also going to be helping people hopefully get a little bit more active, which should be an exciting time. But uh, folks at home, I will leave this with you. Why do you do the grind? Why are you so kind of interested in collecting resources and and making your way through this game considering that once you reach the top of the tech tree there is nowhere higher to go let us know we'd love to hear from you but that's going to be it for this episode of the spawn chunks you can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff we've talked about at the spawnchunks.com the music for the show is composed by me and as we mentioned in the middle of the show the spawn chunks is proud to be a listener supported podcast if you get some value out of the show you can put some value back into it not only by visiting patreon.com com slash the spawn chunks joining our community and getting access to all the lovely bonus content but also contributing to the discussions in our discord which you will get an invite to if you join our patreon campaign we are currently at 112 patrons which is up to from last week hello new people lovely to have you and we want to give a special thanks to our content engineers jd williamson llamas and yitz for supporting this episode Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. It's 100% free. Just poke a friend in the arm and say, hey, you should listen to this. It is super cool. If you're on social media and that is how you want to share it, it is at the Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but like I said, a personal recommendation is by far the best way to do that. You can email the show and let us know what you think about the grind in Minecraft at thespawnchunks at gmail.com. Subscribe on iTunes, Android, Stitcher, and Spotify. And hey, you can also listen to the show on YouTube if you'd like. That's at youtube.com slash the spawn chunks the rss feed is on the spawnchunks.com and the patron only rss feed is on the patreon page and that's the place where you can listen to the render distance the extended version of the podcast my name is johnny but online i go by pixel riffs and you can find most of what i do at youtube.com slash pixel riffs where i make my minecraft survival guide series i also stream three days a week on twitch doing the grind for the survival guide and i'm the voice for the unofficial hermitcraft recap which you can find through a quick youtube search aside from that i'm at pixel riffs on both twitter and instagram joel where can people find you online Everything that I am doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio, is at joelduggan.com. If you are interested in hiring me, then just drop me a line through the website there. The Citadel Cafe is a podcast I do about sci-fi and geeky entertainment. You can check that out at thecitadelcafe.com or on your podcasting platform of choice. It's very easy to find. And you can follow me on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram, all with just my name, Joel Duggan. I will, as always, point you towards Twitch. That seems to be where the crowd is gathering these days. I have an art show coming up later on uh, this this month. It's called the Dartmouth Comic Arts Festival. So I will be streaming some extra artwork in the weeks to come. Check that out at twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite. Back to the grind. <laughs>